Good morning. Rise. Are we ready to worship the Lord today? Where it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We're going to praise him today. Ready? Let's praise him together. Welcome, everybody. Hello, Rise. We're so glad you're here today. And if you're new with us today, we ask you just look in the seat in front of you. We got these new here cards, start here cards. Go ahead and fill one of those out. Just take a moment and then take it to the desk in the front. Uh, we have a little gift for you, just a way of saying thank you for being here. We're so glad you're here. We are going to continue our worship with more singing, and we're going to hear a great relevant message. And then, of course, we're going to do communion, so be ready for that. Look for that cup in front of you. But before we get to that, let's pray. Lord, Thank you for the opportunity to come freely and worship together. We ask you to join us in our worship. Join us in the message. Help it become something that just 
resonates with us and with everything that happens today, help it make us better reflections of you so that when we go out into the world, people see you. And we praise you. And in your name we pray. Amen. You stand your feet this as we continue to worship.
but I needed someone, and they did, tear off the roof and lower me down into God's presence because he's the great physician. He's the great physician, and I know that each one of us in this room has something that we can relate to God tearing, someone taking and tearing that roof off so that we could be in God's presence. And they lowered us down, and we didn't leave that room until God broke through. And he broke through, and he's rescued us. And if you're in that place right now where you need someone to tear off the roof, don't leave here today without allowing us to help tear that roof open and allowing you to be in God's presence because you are his child and he loves you and he cares for you and he wants nothing more than for you to come home, to be lowered down and he is going to break through. Sing with us again. Sing from the heart because someone tore off that roof. Lower me down, whatever it takes to get me to you. Roll every stone, push through the crowd. God, I want to see you break through. Tear off the roof, lower me down, whatever it takes to get me to you. Roll every stone, push through the crowd. God, I want to see you break through. Tear off the roof, lower me down. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through jail. Why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength.
God, we worship you, not because of good things, not because of bad things, not because when it's raining or when it's sunny. We worship you because you are God and you are holy. God, we worship you. We thank you for who you are, that you are the firm foundation for our lives. Touch us and guide us. May we open our hearts and ears as, as wide as we possibly know how. Touch us. Heal us. In Jesus' name we pray, the strong Son of God. Amen.
What's going on, y'all? How you guys doing? So good to see you guys. What a blessing it is that we can come together, gather together, worship together in the name of Jesus. Man, that name is the name that is above every name. At his name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. There is victory in that name. And that name communicates so much to us. And it communicates so much to us because what that symbol communicates to us, that we have been separated from our sin. That we, our debt has been satisfied, paid in full. Man, that's the God that we serve. The God who loves you, the God who knows you, the God who sees you, and the God who desires to reveal purpose for you. You know, the foundation of every relationship is one thing. Communication. Every victory is built on communication. Last night, uh, I was invited to go to a fight, and a hockey game broke out. Um, and uh, it's amazing to watch these these large men on these little skates, like, just tear up the ice. And, like, they hit that little hockey puck, and there's a big guy with all these pads, and it goes into the net. Like, crazy, y'all. Like, how this, how this can even happen, number one. Like, I don't think physics works that way. Uh, but they make it happen. And the only reason that we can watch a championship team like the Florida Everblades is because they are effective at communicating. Their line changes, uh, where the puck is, the movement, the passing, everything has to do with those foundations of communication. And foundation of communication, and the stronger that communication is, the better that communication is, the better that relationship will become. The more effective you will be, the, the more victories you will end up experiencing. You will never have a relationship with, you will never see a victory if you don't effectively communicate. I, I want to introduce you to a fella. Um, so there's this guy. I, I really regret this. Um, and the fact that I did this twice is so bad, right? This guy, he's a dork, man. Like, you know how I know? Look at those frosted tips, y'all. Like, that says it all right there. This guy is a massive dork. So this is like those awkward, this awkward space, 15 years old, y'all. And like, that has got to be like the most awkward age that anybody can be in. Because you're like, who am I? What do I do? Why do I smell funny? Like, how come all of a sudden I notice these other creatures that are around? Like, if you're a guy, you're like, hey, Yo, oh, there's these things called girls, and I don't know how they work, but I want one, right? Like, <laughs> you end up in this weird space of, like, trying to figure things out and trying to navigate things, and, like, and it just comes out as just one big awkward mess. And so this guy, he was invited to go to the movies with a group of friends, and, and little did he know in all of this, there was this, like, setup that was happening where these three guys and these three girls were going to kind of like, like pair off. And uh, so this guy shows up, and he doesn't say anything at all, like nothing to the girl that he's supposed to be, you know, there with. Talks to everybody else but her. So you got 15, 20 minutes before the movie starts, you got all the credits. Doesn't say anything. You got the movie rolling on. Because this guy thinks he's a player. He's like, I think that said everything I needed it to right there, right? End of the movie. Everybody's hanging out. Everybody's talking. But this guy's not talking to the girl that he's supposed to be there with. And then you know what happens? He goes home. He's like, that was awesome, man. I can't believe it. Like, I went to the movies with a girl and it was incredible and like I I I think we're going out now like I think this is like boyfriend girlfriend time like I'm gonna get your name tattooed on my arm right with a little sharpie like this thing is gonna happen like this is it and then show up for school on Monday guess what we didn't talk to each other then either right so it's like so weird this place you're in do you think a relationship developed no, we didn't even say anything to each other. However, for that brief moment in my mind, she was the one, right? <laughs> Amazing. You think like you do that once, you'd never do it again. 
let's even fast forward a few years. Like, let's go ahead to, to 19 years old. And you're like, ah, oh, Nick, you could never do what you just did when you were 15 again at 19. Watch me, right? <laughs> Buddy of mine, his girlfriend, let's set Nick up. Okay, we're going to go play pool. Because that's a little bit more like conversational than movies. We're going to go play pool. Never mind the fact that this guy doesn't really do that very well, but we're going to do this thing. We are in the car for like 45 minutes. Guess what? Didn't say anything to her. We're playing pool. We're on the same team. We're teammates. Guess what? Didn't say anything to her. 45-minute drive home. Not a word. Gets home. Everyone says their goodnights, or he waves in this case, and was like, that was awesome. <laughs> Nailed it, right? No. There was no communication at all between the two. This dude fell flat on his face. Thank God. There was this other blind date that he was set up on with this girl named Casey. And like he said something to her. Maybe that's all. Thank God. Just keep my mouth shut. I don't know. Sorry. I don't know. Because my dashing good looks, right, you all know, like, that was enough, right? Like, backstreet boys, right, watch out, downtown dorks, right? Like, that's what this is all about right here. Like, I start my own boy band. Um, so, ma'am, bad communication, it destroys relationships. Good communication, it builds relationships. Bad communication, it starts wars. Good communication, it ends wars. No communication, no relationship. Right? It's just the way it works. And the amazing thing is in all of that is so often we fail to communicate, but we have this expectation of reciprocation from the other person. That they are somehow going to respond as if we were in a mature relationship when we've never put in the time, the work, the effort, the energy to develop this thing. Last week we took a look at, at this tool that we've been given. The instruction manual for life, right? It's, it's right here. Every one of those pages, every word that's in there is meant to meet us in whatever space we're in. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you're dealing with, there is something for you in the Bible. God lays it all out right there. He, he gives us this tool to help us navigate the challenges of life, and through it we're revealed this other tool that we're being given. This tool of, of coming into this place of communication with the creator of the universe. It's through this thing called prayer. I don't know, that's, that's challenging. Some of us are like, whoa, did you say the P word in church? Like, are we allowed to do that? How do I even do that? Is this one of those kind of things? I'm out. One scholar says this, says, prayer links us with God in the right way and puts us in dialogue with him. Not praying is a little like waking up or walking up to the, the marriage altar, saying one's vows to the spouse, and then going as mute as the relationship, going mute as the relationship moves from day to day. But think about that. Like this fool shows up at the movies, ain't say nothing. Then he shows up at the pool hall, ain't say nothing. Imagine you show up at the altar and you ain't say nothing after that. Like that's some of you guys are like, can I pray for that for my spouse? Like <laughs> Is that off limits? Because I'm down, right? He says this. He says, there can be no development of a deeper connection without time for table talk. In fact, without such basic contact, the relationship not only fails to go forward, it moves backwards. Like, it, that's how relationships are destroyed. It's not because we've got to this place, and so therefore I'm just going to maintain it by not saying another word. When we stop saying those words, it begins to erode. Our relationship begins to evaporate. It begins to fold. And the amazing thing is, is the creator of the universe desires for us to come into a space where we communicate with him. Like he gives us his time, which doesn't mean anything to him, but we have access to him 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It, it doesn't matter when, where, what's going on. He wants to communicate with you, and he's given us this, this instrument, this tool that is called prayer. It's so powerful and yet so underutilized by so many of us. Listen to how 
That's not how the, the word speaks about prayer. Paul says this. He says that we are to pray without ceasing. You're probably like, well, Nick, I certainly don't have time for that. You mean I'm supposed to like be on my knees, eyes closed, head down? Like, I can't do that 24 hours a day. Like, your boy's got to eat, right? How does this even work? Man, what Paul's revealing here is this isn't, this isn't a pneumatic process. It's not about the words that come out of our mouth. This is a hydraulic process. This is about our heart. This is about what's inside of us. This is about posturing ourselves toward the Lord, that we are in this constant communication with him. Paul tells us that, that we are to move into this holy space of prayer when we feel anxious. How many of y'all deal with anxiety? Or how many of y'all deal with stress? How many of y'all deal with depression? How many of y'all just deal with the struggles of life? Guess what? Every hand up, right? Y'all, that's everybody. What do we do when we're in that space where things just seem to be falling apart, when we get anxious, when we get depressed, when we get stressed out? So often, what do we do? We, we pick up a six-pack on the way home from work. Maybe we turn to that vape pen. Maybe we turn to that joint. Maybe we turn to the end of the needle or we turn to, to a, a relationship that wasn't filled or based on communication but was just based on some carnal, fleshy desire to satisfy something that I have. And what we find in all of that is it just leads us deeper and deeper into those broken spaces. The Bible tells us to just bring our anxiety to the Lord in prayer. Does it mean it's going to go away immediately? No. Nah. But man, it means you're entering into this space with the advocate, with the creator of the universe, the comforter of humanity, the one who's laid it all out and laid it all online for us. If anybody and anything can lead you through your anxiety, it's the God of the universe. He says, even when you don't know what to pray, and just, just come before the Lord, pray for the Holy Spirit, and he will intercede through wordless groans. I get it. If you've been around somebody for a long enough time, you can just like, you can pick up on their groans, right? Now my wife, we communicate through grunts, eye rolls, and sighs, right? <laughs> Normally, that's how she communicates with me. Why? I don't know. Like, that dashing guy on the screen, he was something, right? <laughs> James says this. He says, he says that if someone is suffering or sick, you know what you should do? Pray. In fact, he goes on to say that if you're suffering or sick, that you should call on the elders. You should ask the elders of the church, and they will pray for you. They will pray over you. They will anoint you with oil, which isn't as weird as it sounds. It's a little dab and, and a little cross on your forehead, and then we just put, your hand, put our hands on your shoulders and pray over you. This is a practice that we have highly neglected as a church. I'm going to lay it out there right now. I mean, if you're suffering, if you're sick, if you're struggling, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is you are dealing with, there is power in prayer. The amazing thing is, though, it's not our words. It's not the oil. It's the obedience that we are coming to the Lord with, the connection of relationship that is being developed when we're communicating with him. Jude says this, he says, Prayer operates as an instrument to build our faith. And then he goes on to say, our faith is fuel for prayer. It puts us in this cycle that our faith leads us to prayer. Our prayer builds our faith. Our faith leads us to prayer. And then our prayer builds our faith. So often we get stuck in these cycles. You find this cycle embedded in the Bible, this cycle of judges where everything is good, and so everybody turns away from the Lord, and then things get hard, and then they turn back to the Lord, and then everything gets good, and they turn away from the Lord. Like, we, we develop, we endeavor into those same cycles. Cycle of addiction, cycle of sin, same thing. We have this thing that triggers us in our life. What do we do? It leads us into an action that we know we shouldn't be doing, but gives us some little feeling of control in our life, some little bit of medication in our life. On the back end of that, we feel shame, and then we're triggered again, and then it leads us back into this downward spiral. spiral. What Jude is saying is, no, no, let's put you in a different trajectory. This is an upward spiral. 
where prayer builds your faith and faith builds your prayer life, which builds your faith, which builds your prayer life. Let's give you a new cycle. And it all comes by way of prayer. What a powerful tool we've been given. Jesus prays. And Jesus is God. And, and I know it's one of those weird things. Father, Son, Spirit comprises the, the, the singular being that is God, and, and it's three persons, and yet he's one. And, and how does that work? I don't know. And there's no good explanation that you will find. Anybody who endeavors into saying this is how this works, wrong. I'm going to tell you that. They're wrong. Because you can't, like, we can't even fathom this in the human mind of how this operates. This is one of those faith things that we've got to understand. But what do we find throughout the course of, of Scripture? Jesus' ministry, him escaping, going off, and what is he doing? He's praying, communicating, connecting with the Father in the Spirit, satisfying this, this incredible connection. Jesus says this, he says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. That's a big statement. Some of y'all all of a sudden are like, I like what this Bible has to say in this Jesus fellow. So you mean to tell me that Powerball ticket that I got in my pocket, all I got to say is, Lord, I believe. In Jesus' name, you turn that thing into the winner. That's, that's not where Jesus goes with this. And God answers all of our prayers, okay? He doesn't always answer them the way we want him to, Right? There's three prominent ways that God answers our prayers. Yes, no, wait. Well, that's the one we really don't like, is it? Yes, no, wait. Lord, I know you can do this thing right now. Do this thing right now. Wait. Because I've got to do something in you first. Because right now you want this thing for all the wrong reasons. Because I'm working on that broken space that's inside of you. And in order for it to be, to be completely mended, completely healed, completely fixed, I need you to wait. God knows what he's doing. And if God answered every one of our prayers in the way we wanted him to, at the time we wanted him to, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be. Because our, our prayers are short-sighted. Our prayers are selfish. A lot of times our prayers are empty. A lot of times our prayers don't exist. So we've got to see in all of this, this man, God is moving, God is working, God is stirring. If we're willing to come to him in prayer, Jesus goes on to teach us how to pray. First he says, hey, don't be, don't be like those fools that go out there and like make a spectacle of themselves on the street corners, praying to God so everybody think they all holy and stuff. Don't be like them. Just go in your house. Go into the inner room of your house and fast. Close the door behind you. Pray. Don't be like those fools that just multiply words, thinking that if I say all the things all at once and use all of these flowery ways of massaging and manipulating that I usually use with the people around me, that somehow I'm going to manipulate God into doing the thing that I want. And don't, don't, allow, don't just go on babbling, right? You're, like, like you're not a 17-year-old teenage girl. Like, not that I've experienced this in my house where it just feels like the words that just get multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and all of a sudden I'm just beat into submission because all the words, right? God doesn't operate that way, y'all. Then he says this. Here's how you pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses, our sins, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us, who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Now, I don't know about you, but it's not a lot of words. But there's a whole lot of heart embedded in that. It's acknowledgement of God. Father, 
And I know that can take us to some dark places because some of our dads, some of our fathers on earth, they were not good. He's our father in heaven. He nurtures, he cares, he provides, he protects. He's in heaven. And he's all things, all places. We're asking for his kingdom to come, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We get into that place where, where we acknowledge his station and his substance. And then it's all about submission and trust along with that bold petition. And will you pray? Forgive me, God, the way I forgive others? Will you present that to the creator of the universe? Because Jesus says that's where your heart's right. He reveals that's how you know your heart is right. Is if you are willing to come before the maker and the judge of all things and say, forgive me the way I forgive others. And then he wraps up with this realization that the enemy will work to deceive and to manipulate you. But that the Lord is our protection and our provision. And the only way that we take on that protection and that provision of the Lord is through prayer. <laughs> Communicating with the creator of the universe. I think about that. Before you were, he was. He said, he just spoke, let there be. And it was. And it was good. He's, he's the one telling us to, to come into communion with him. When we were no good, when we were separated from him, and he, he loved us so much that he donned this flesh and he hung on that cross so that we could have eternal communion with him. And that's the God, that's the God who wants to meet you in your mess. It's the God who says, I'm accessible to you whenever, wherever, whatever. That's the God who we pray to. And we find Jesus praying all throughout the course of his ministry. We think about where his ministry kind of kicked off. That moment where he he comes before John the baptizer and he says, man, you got to baptize me. And after a little bit of an argument, he finally wins and takes Jesus down into the, into the Jordan. And, and, and we read that, that he was praying in the midst of this. And, and I'd imagine Jesus didn't go under the water audibly saying words, right? That would get a little bit weird. But he was praying. He was praying to the Father. And we read that as he comes up, the, the Holy Spirit descends upon him and a voice rumbles from the heavens and says, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Do whatever he says. Prayer in inaugurating this moment. When Jesus is charged to go out and to call out those 12 men, those 12 disciples that would follow him for for the next three years of their lives and would go on to form a movement that is essentially the reason we're here today. Do you know where he starts this whole thing? He starts it in prayer. We read that he goes up on a mountainside to pray and he spent the night praying to God because he knew how, how substantial this would be. Did Jesus know who he was supposed to pick? Absolutely he did. But man, he went to the Lord, and he, went to, he went to the Father in prayer that very night before he went out and chose those men. See, that moment where he chooses three of those 12, Peter, James, John, he pulls them up onto the mountainside. And you know why they went up there? They went up there to pray. And as Jesus is praying, we see that, that his face, the appearance of his face, it's transformed his his robes are, are turned into this brilliant light, as, as bright as, as a flash of lightning, we're told. And all of this is ushered in in this place of prayer. We find Jesus in the garden on the night of his betrayal. What is he doing? And he knows the hard that's coming. He knows the struggle that's coming. He knows the hurts that's coming. He knows what he's on the doorstep of. 
He asked his disciples, he said, fellas, I just need you to hang out here and I need you to pray with me. I'm going to go over here. And we read about him going over there and falling to his knees and these, these, these drops of blood falling from his brow like sweat and him just calling out, petitioning the Father, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, but not as you will, not as I will, but as you will, your will be done. What a profound statement. Because so often our prayers end midway through that prayer. Father, take this thing from me. Not as I will, as you will. Jesus is betrayed. He's sentenced to death for a crime he didn't commit. He's hung upon the cross. He's, he's got spikes driven through his hands, driven through his feet. He hung there for six hours, and do you know what he did with his last breath? He prayed. Father. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last breath. The human that was Jesus. Separated from the spirit that is Jesus. For three days until he rose again. And Jesus, he prayed. He prayed through the pain. He prayed through the moments of praise, he prayed in order to maintain proper alignment and relationship with the Father who he was one with. This is the power of prayer. And we read time and time again that Jesus would wake up early in the morning and that he would go out to a solitary place and he would pray. How's your day start? Right, alarm goes off, okay? Five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, for some of y'all. And you're like, snooze, 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 right? And then all of a sudden your body's like, man, you got to get up or you're about to wet this bed, right? And so biology sets in and you're like, okay, I'm up, I'm out, we're going to do this thing. You go to the bathroom and then where do you go? You pick up the phone, right? What did I miss last night? What new TikToks launched for me now, right? Or what new reels are there out there now? What did I miss that went on while I was sleeping? We begin to endeavor into the broken spaces of the world. And that sets us, sets the tone for a day that is going to be inevitably filled with all of the broken spaces of this world. We set off to fail in the very beginning of our day. Jesus started his day in prayer. By starting in prayer, we're moving into the presence of God and we enter into that place of alignment with him. Starting the day in God's presence offers the opportunity to encounter the day with God's perspective. All of a sudden, when we start there, those mountains in front of us, they don't seem quite as high. Those hard things that we encounter, man, they don't seem quite as hard. Those challenges that we run across, they don't seem quite as substantial. Because now all of a sudden we're looking at the broken things of this world through a brand new lens, through the lens of our Father who is in heaven, through the lens of our Maker, through the lens of our Creator, because we began our day in the presence of the Holy of Holies. We, we began our day in the presence of the Creator of it all and the Sustainer of it all. Jesus prays consistently, persistently, and he tells us to do the same. After he lays out, here's how you pray. He shares this parable. He says, suppose you have a friend and, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey and has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not give up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need because you just stay after it. Jimmy, bread! You just keep knocking. You just keep knocking. Come on, man, I'm going to wake your kids up. You better get up right now or I'm going to wake them up. And you know, when I, when I wake them up, I'm not going back to bed. It's up to you. Because of your shameless 
audacity, because of your boldness, because of your persistence. He goes on to say, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Ask, seek, knock. There's persistence in prayer. And when prayer persists, the things that we begin asking for start getting better. The things that we, we start seeking, they become more substantial. The doors that we start knocking on, and they become the right doors instead of all those wrong doors that we've been knocking on for a really long time. All when we continue in, in this place of persistence in prayer. And God doesn't make it hard. And he doesn't ask us to uh, desire for us to beg or plead before him. But he desires a, a, a proper posture so that we can receive what he truly desires for us. Jesus says that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then our request will be added. Seek seek first the kingdom of God. God is a first responder, not a last resorter. And so often that's the place we end up, right? After I've done everything I can, after I've put everything I have into it, after after I've asked every person I know, then all of a sudden... All right, Lord, well, it's obvious I can't do this on my own. You're up. Make this thing happen. That's that's so often the way life goes. He says, seek first the kingdom of God. It will put you in this place of, of righteousness, and then your requests will be added because your requests will become what he requests, what he desires for our lives. God sees what we don't. He knows what we don't. He's infinitely wise and infinitely capable, and yet he's the last place we end up. The amazing thing is, is when we go to him in prayer, when we begin aligning with him, that's when things begin to move. That's when things begin to change. That's when when things that can't be done in our own strength start to happen. We become powerful when we become prayerful. And yet it's one of the most neglected things in our lives. I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. It doesn't matter. Holy Spirit intercedes. When do I do this? Start off the day, man. Why are you endeavoring into the junk of stuff? Like, start off in the right posture. How long should I do it? It's between you and the Lord. Pray without ceasing, in fact. Don't ever stop. And it's, this is how it's laid out before us, so that we can enter into the presence of the creator of the universe. I want to kind of tie it all up with this. If you have your Bible with you, I want to spend just a moment in the book of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah, Old Testament guy. So if, if you're going through your Bible and you're turning there, like you get the Kings and Chronicles and then Ezra and then Nehemiah, if you're in Psalms, Proverbs, you've gone too far, go back, right? Um, so Nehemiah was a bullfrog, right? It just seems like it should go in there. Nehemiah was a servant to the king of Persia. He was a Jew. He was in operating in this space where the people of God were in exile. God led him into the promised land. They abandoned him. They divided into these north, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom fell, to, or the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. Southern kingdom falls to the Babylonians. All of the best and the brightest of, of Jerusalem, of Judah, are taken captive into Babylon. The rest of the people, they're just kind of left there to fend for themselves. We find after 40 years, Persians take over. Cyrus says, all right. I'll send you guys back. Like, why don't you, I'll give you all the stuff the Babylonians took from you. You go back, rebuild your temple. First enclave goes back under the, the guidance of a fellow by the name of Ezra. We find that Ezra runs into some hard hardship, though, some, some challenges. And then we run headlong into this introduction of Nehemiah. Let's pick up in verse 1, chapter 1. In the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the tw- 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. 
They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Just put a pin in that right there. Where did Nehemiah go when he didn't know what to do? He went to the Lord. And a whole lot can be said about fasting in that as well, but we, we don't have time for that today. But, but man, he, he went to the Lord in prayer. And you can, you can feel the weight that this man is dealing with. And you know where that comes from? That comes from this deep connection with who God is. This isn't the first time Nehemiah prayed. You know this isn't the first time Nehemiah prayed. He was a man of prayer. He petitioned the Lord on a day-to-day basis. He was in deep relationship with the Lord because when he heard about the the broken nature of the place that bore the name of God, man, it, it, it broke him. You know this was a man who was in deep communion with the Creator, even though he was some 800 miles removed from Jerusalem and probably never even set a foot in the city. But man, he was connected to the Creator Because he prayed. We go on to read his prayer. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people who are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servant who delights in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Let's hit that for just one hot minute. I was a cupbearer to the king. The cupbearer to the king, this would have been one of the most trusted people in the entire kingdom because you know what he did? He bore the cup of the king. So any fluid that was passing into the chalice and into the gullet of the king would first make its way through the cupbearer to ensure there ain't no junk Nobody poisoned the water hole, basically, right? Like before Nehemiah would, would present the king with his cup, a little bit of that would be poured into his hands, and he'd take a little swig, and, and man, we know if he died, probably don't drink that. If he got sick, nope, out, right? This was the role of Nehemiah, so he would have been incredibly trusted. He would have been the man that the king would have, man, would have held on to. He was the official wine taster of the kingdom. I know some of you guys are like, am I sent up there? Um, and I get it, that as he starts to pray, it sounds like he's just patronizing God. Oh, you're so great. Oh, you're so awesome. Like, I know when my kids start off that way, they're coming for a big request, right? Like, what do you want? How much? Right? That's really, oh, you're so great. Oh, you're so awesome. But Man, he's not coming to butter God up. He's not patronizing the creator of the universe. He's posturing himself before the Lord. He's acknowledging and recognizing the awesome nature of God, that he is the God in heaven, that he is the maker of all things. Super important to recognize. In a time and a place where there were false deities, Nehemiah knew that there was only one to pray to, and it was the God in heaven. He was doing this more for the posture of his heart than he was the patronizing of his God. Nehemiah Nehemiah even went on to acknowledge his status before the Lord. Look, God, I'm a servant. In fact, I'm a sinner as well. You have no reason, no right to listen to me but I know your promises and I know your grace 
and I know what you desire to do. So Lord, I'm just going to come into your presence and I'm just going to come and petition you and I'm just going to come and lay it all out before you. Do what you do, Lord. You're the only one who can. We go on to continue. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, and so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? I, th I think there was another question the king was asking there. Are you ill? And was it because of what you drank? The incredible part of this is, I mean, the king sees something else. He says, this can be nothing but sadness of the heart. And because of the close communion that Nehemiah was with the creator of the universe, the fact that his heart was broken for the people of God, it revealed itself through his face. He says, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad where my ancestors are buried in lies and ruins? And the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? This is a question that needed to be answered in the right way. Because if Nehemiah just laid out, I want to go back and rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls and rebuild the gate of a city that was once an enemy of this kingdom. Dude could be hung for treason. Killed for treason. You mean you want to go back there? You want to rebuild that thing that is an enemy to me? What does Nehemiah do? Then I prayed to the God in heaven. The king asked him the question, what is it you want? Nehemiah, he immediately goes, all right, Lord, what do I want? Because I want what you want. What is it that I want? Give me the words right now. And he answers the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. What do we find happen? The king says, done. We would imagine all of this had to start because of where Nehemiah started. When you think about this for one hot minute, when we're introduced to Nehemiah, we're introduced to him in the month of Kislev, which is somewhere November, December on, on our current calendar. It's where we pick up in Nehemiah chapter 2, we pick up in the month of Nisan, which is somewhere March, April. It's about a four-month span. You know what Nehemiah did for four months? Prayed. Every day. He petitioned the God of all creation to use him to do something, to rebuild, to restore, to break his heart for what was, what was burdening the Father in heaven. Four months of prayer. Could God have answered that day one? Absolutely he could have. Should he? No. Because he was doing the groundwork. He was rebuilding the heart of this man. He was putting him in the proper posture in order to receive this profound initiative that was going to be laid before him. And it took four months of praying on repeat the same prayer in order for God to reveal his timing, his mission, his purpose. We are called to pray without ceasing. We are called to continue in prayer. We are called to come and petition the Lord with absolute persistence. Is once enough? It can be. But is every day the best? Absolutely. Pray until God moves. Do it. It's crazy because throughout the course of, of what we're given in these 13 chapters of Nehemiah, we find that he just prays. When threats came, Nehemiah prayed. When good came, Nehemiah prayed. When he needed strength, Nehemiah prayed. When others were challenged, not even him, Nehemiah prayed. When the work was done, Nehemiah prayed. When others failed, Nehemiah prayed. And with the very last line of his book, do you know what Nehemiah did? He prayed. And his whole life was postured around prayer. 
And because of it, God did something profound. He purposed every step. He gave him wisdom. He gave him shrewdness. He gave him success. He knew how important the relationship with the Lord was, how vital alignment was. And he knew the only way to align with the Lord was in prayer. Nehemiah prayed. And it gave him that kingdom perspective that he he sought. When he heard the hardship faced by God's people, and he felt it. When he prayed, God answered again and again. God answered because he built his life on the foundation of prayer. He put himself in that holy space every day, knowing that the persistence in prayer can bring the impossible, aligning his actions and intentions with the actions and intentions of the creator of it all. Nehemiah prayed. So should we. It doesn't matter if you have the right words. All that matters is that you have the right heart. That's what God's after. The amazing thing is after you keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep knocking, all of a sudden that position of your heart begins to shift a little bit. Your prayers begin to change a little bit. The amazing thing is, is as your prayers begin to change, so do you. Drawing nearer and nearer to the creator of God responds to our prayers when we align with his promises. And those, those prayers, they put us on a path to purpose for this life. And yet none of it would be possible without a deep relationship, without the deep relationship that comes from communicating with our creator through prayer. I'm going to challenge y'all. I'm going to invite y'all. First and foremost, on Thursday nights, starting at 7 p.m., we're going to have a, a prayer meeting. It's shifting a little bit. We used to do it on, on Tuesday nights. We're going to start doing it on Thursday. We're going to have a little bit of music incorporated into it. Matt's going to be, be leading us in, in prayer and some worship. And when we become a people of prayer, our lives begin to change. Our hearts begin to change. Our families begin to change. Our workspaces begin to change. Our community begins to change. Our world, it begins to change. And it all starts with prayer. So I'm going to encourage you every day. Start with prayer. Every Thursday, let's pray corporately. Man, if you're sick, if you're struggling, come forward and the elders will pray with you. Be a people of prayer. And nothing will be impossible. place of communing with the Lord in this moment. If you're here with us in your seat back, there's a communion cup with a wafer on the top. If you're joining us online, grab some crackers, grab some juice. Jesus gathered his disciples on the night of the Passover, that feast that celebrates freedom. Before he lifted the, the loaf of bread, we we're told that he, he blesses it. He prays over it. He says, this is my body that's been broken for you. He breaks the bread and he says, take and eat. Then he lifts the cup. And he says, this is my blood that's been shed for you. And it is a brand new promise. It's the promise of forgiveness. Do this in remembrance. Take and drink. Let's pray. Father, you are the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer of all things. You call us into deep communion with you every single day. You allow us that opportunity to come before you, to offer things that we may think are insignificant and, and also things that we may feel are incredibly substantial. You desire to hear from us. You desire to be in communion with us. You desire for us to have a deep and intimate relationship. 
Lord, let us be a people of prayer. Let us be a people who are passionate about knowing you and being known. Let us be a people who watch the impossible happen because we are so closely connected with you. You are the God who moves mountains. You are the God who raises the dead. You are the God who does as you will. And Lord, I pray that we will have your will. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy and your hope, all that you give to us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer, I'm going to be standing in the back as we, as we wrap up today. If you want to get baptized today, we've got t-shirts, towels, and shorts in the back. We can make that happen as well. Remember what the word said. Sick? Let's pray. And you got something to praise? Yeah, let's pray. Let's just be a people of prayer. God bless you guys. All right. That was just awesome. So I just want to get you caught up on some goings around here. So this Thursday, the 18th, from 10 a.m. to 1, we have a second chance job fair. So if you're in need of a job, and maybe even there's been some things holding you back from getting one, this is for you. So Thursday, the 18th, 10 to 1, come get a job. And if you're a job need, if you need someone to fill a job, we still have some spots available. So if you're an employer and you need to get some people in some uh, positions, come see us. Uh, also, so for the students, you guys, the, the, the congregation, you have the opportunity this year to help us send the kids to move this summer. And we have our Rent-A-Kid fundraiser, which means if you have things around the house, inside or outside, that you need done, rent us. We'd love to get it done for you. It helps uh, pay our way towards that trip this summer. Uh, just sign up for that on Church Center. And then if you're new here or newer here or you've just never been to one, we have a starting point lunch and it's going to be on the 21st after the second gathering of the day. Uh, and it's going to be awesome. You get to you know, meet all the pastors. You'll hear more of Pastor Nick's story. Uh, you're going to we'll have a delicious lunch. And then you get a behind the scenes look, a tour of the building, and it's going to be great. But the food is going to be awesome and we need to know how much to make. So make sure you go to Church Center for all of these things and sign up so that we know how much to prepare. And finally, we're going to end our day with the last thing, the last part of our worship, and that is in our giving. And we don't give out of compulsion. We give out of our worship for God. And so if you're new here and that's kind of new for you, don't even worry about it. But for those of us who are being moved by God and then who respond in that way, this is our time to do so. And you can do so through the boxes we have in the back. You can do it on Church Center or on our website, risefl.org slash giving. And before we get out of here, let's just pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come together for the worship today, for the message today, especially about prayer itself. Thank you, Lord, to help just continue to give us that posture that sees you above everything else. Lord, just continue to pour into us and make us better reflections of you as we go out today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming and have a great day.